Hi everyone and welcome to Theory of Next. I'm Nitin Sharma, partner at Antler India. Antler is one of the world's fastest growing early stage startup investing platforms. We are in 17 geographies globally and especially well suited for founders building in India for the world. We go very early. The earlier the better, when things are purely concepts. And it is with that mindset that we always need to be at the cutting edge of what technologies, spaces and themes are going to shape our future. And so we thought, let's create a new property that underlines this. So welcome to Theory of Next. So you might be wondering, what's unique about this Theory of Next? Well, we asked ourselves the same question. And one thing we learned after having talked to so many hundreds and thousands of founders and would-be founders is that the process by which a venture firm or a team arrives at a thesis is quite opaque. So we asked ourselves, can we build this in public and lay bare the process of discussion, debate and the deep research that leads to a team crystallizing a thesis around a new space or a new idea. And so that's what we are going to expose to the whole world in this process. So we're excited to cover a lot of spaces and ideas, starting with areas that we have deep experience in and a deep passion for. Web3 in the metaverse, DAOs, NFTs, crypto in general, climate change, electric vehicles, mental wellness, and so on. We'll try to do this with a first principles approach, using building blocks to systematically build the case for why we should or should not invest in something. And so this will be approachable even if you're new to this space or theme. And then for those who want to dive in deeper, we will have a long form thesis piece out for public consumption as well. So we hope you'll enjoy it. Welcome to Theory of Next. Let's dive in. Climate change is the biggest challenge of our generation. And every time oil prices spike or climate change is debated, EVs, electric vehicles, are inevitably mentioned as a huge part of that solution. We have several new companies entering the space every day. The EV value chain has become very well defined. There are massive companies like Tesla reaching trillion dollar valuations. And yet, somehow it feels they've not achieved their potential. That's our topic for today. Is this a case of slowly then suddenly? Let's dive in. Hi guys, so let's get started. In this series, we're going to go into Web3, NFTs, a lot of things in crypto. But the first topic we want to start with is electric vehicles, EV. And uh, this is as much of a chance for me to learn as it is for you, because one of the things we want to do with this series is expose the internal thinking inside a VC firm and how uh, some of our younger investors are actually domain experts. So it gives me immense pleasure to introduce Vineeth, who is our go-to guy for EV and has tremendous insights and uh, prior experience having worked at uh, Ola, specifically focusing on this topic. So Vineeth, why don't we start with your introduction? Thanks, Nitin. Hi, everyone. I'm Vineeth Agarwal. I manage uh, India Investments for Antler. Prior to joining Antler, spent time in the corporate development team at Ola uh, and also previously spent some time in the investment banking division of Goldman Sachs. While at Ola, I did a lot of work on the electric vehicle uh, ecosystem, specifically around fundraiser strategy and MA, uh, and was closely involved in Ola Electric's acquisition of Itergo, which was a Netherlands based electric scooter company. Okay, we need so I think everyone's aware of vehicles, right? But let's actually take a nuanced view of what the value chain in the landscape looks like. So first things first, especially for those who are new to the space, how do we break it down? On right. the vehicle, uh, the landscape is essentially how the vehicle is built. So there's lithium and then, uh, you know, lithium is used to create cells. Uh, multiple of these cells are then used to create a battery pack. Uh, the battery along with a few other components essentially create the vehicle. So this is the entire vehicle landscape. Just like solar had cells and modules. Exactly. and. Exactly. The same as that. Now, for the whole ecosystem to exist, you need a lot of non-vehicle related things. Right. Broadly, five of them. First is service and distribution network. In order for the vehicle to sell, you'll have to create a distribution network. And after sales service requires a service network. So that is number one. Second is charging and swapping infrastructure. So we have to set up that infrastructure that can support and power those vehicles. Mm -hmm. Third is the grid in itself. What supplies energy to the charging stations or to the swapping infrastructure? Now, unfortunately, today, most of the grid is still reliant on, you know, uh, coal. Uh, but over time, we would see more technologies around Renewables. solar, yeah. renewable energy, for instance. Beyond that, uh, you know, uh, the other two categories 
one is more uh, you know an ancillary which is essentially financing uh, today it has it has not been completely solved for but uh, financing is a massive opportunity especially given the price difference upfront cost is higher for an ev versus that uh, for an ic counterpart and final uh, the final opportunity is not a here and now it's more of a long term over the next 4 or 5 years but battery recycling and reusability just to give you some stats uh, a battery becomes unusable on an ev at 80% of its capacity but the battery is still at 80% of its capacity right so there are other alternative use cases for example plain and simple energy storage you know the question was to why a vc should look at it you know one big uh, impediment has been this is a very capital intensive play but beyond that also in a way this market is not actually taken off right yep. when did reva was it what 15 Twenty years a, ago, it's more than twenty years ago. Right, and so w- what's our penetration in the market today? One percent. Yeah, so we are we are currently at um, actually less than one percent of vehicles sold in India is an electric vehicle today. Uh, to be precise, it's at it, it's at about point eight percent of all vehicles sold in India. So uh, Tesla has been around for a long time, right? W- yep. Why hasn't this market taken off? I I would say broadly there are three reasons. One and first and foremost is product. A person does not buy a Tesla because he wants to buy an electric vehicle. A person buys a Tesla because he wants to buy a Tesla. And what makes Tesla what it is? It is mm. the product. So the key reason for limited adoption of an electric vehicle is product. Second is pricing. And by product, you really are talking about the connectedness of the device and the coolness of the ownership. So two two things. One is the practicality of the uh, you know of the vehicle in itself, and second is usability and features and the premiumness of that vehicle. Sure. So it's a combination uh, of both of them. Second reason is pricing parity. India is a value conscious market. As much as people in India aspire to buy a vehicle, they're still value conscious. So pricing parity really sure. is very important. And third is charging infra. Everybody talks about it. We like we don't think it's the key reason, but it's a really important reason. Uh, and yes it's a chicken and egg problem as more and more evs start coming into the market that problem would be solved over time uh, but as of now there is limited adoption of charging infrastructure charging or swapping infrastructure and that is a key reason why there has been limited adoption okay so ppc product pricing charges yes. that's our, that's kind of the build those are the building yes. blocks of our thesis all right so so this is the future according to it's not the future because it is here and now uh, it's a reality so you believe there is something about this time this yes. phase we are in that you know as antler india our, our team should actually really go deep into this i think because uh, i okay so i rather than getting into qualitative reasons let's me let me give you some quantitative reasons let me give you some stats if you remember ola electric launched uh, the ola scooter called for booking for two days they reported sales of 1100 crores in just two days which so broadly implies around 85000 to 1 lakh vehicles sold in just two days now mind you 1 lakh vehicles on a base of 6 lakh vehicles on the road today and this 6 lakh has been built over time so what people have bought over the last 4 or 5 years is 6 lakh and in only 2 2 days are people buying 1 lakh scooters yeah there is a fundamental of shift all of the things in bc which are always slowly then suddenly so yes so it is a fundamental shift is taking off yeah it has taken off it, it has is taken. not taken it has taken off okay yeah so it's not the future anymore it's a opportunity here and now it is on us whether we want to take it Or not. Okay, so let let's just recap for everyone, right? So, one percent penetration right now. Yes, less than one percent. Less than one. Only six lakh. Yes. Vehicles. Yes. Two wheelers, four wheelers. What's the split? So, most of the penetration today is in the three wheeler category for various reasons. Exactly. Two wheelers is the second, but I think two wheelers is the category which is going to see that mass adoption going forward because of a variety of reasons. Most importantly, pricing parity. Four wheelers has had some penetration, but the least of all the categories primary reason is four wheeler demands much more performance four wheeler category demands much more range as a result of which the pricing there is a huge pricing yeah. gap between a four wheeler ic vehicle and a four wheeler electric vehicle yeah. which is why it is still not it still does not make sense it makes sense three wheelers two wheelers then four wheelers yes. that's the evolution and So let's start going through each one of the three things you mentioned. Right? Mm-hmm. Product. Yep. So what exactly is changing? What is key? So I'll actually take an example to explain what has changed. Thirteen uh, years back, uh, I bought my first Honda Activa. 
back then the Activa was priced at forty five thousand. Fuel was forty five rupee a liter. My father thought it was very expensive and suggested I buy an electric vehicle instead. Back then, this was thirteen years back, and electric vehicles still existed back then. Uh, we had a few Chinese companies that used to import and sell it in India. Uh, now, back then, when I was a teenager turning an adult, uh, I had to make a choice, and I'll ask you to make that choice today. If I give you an option to buy a vehicle, the top speed of which is thirty kilometers per hour, uh, and the range is fifty. It does not look good, Nitin. Would you buy that vehicle? And of course and, not. And Activa is forty-five thousand. This was like thirty-five thousand. Of was course cheap. not. If I if if I tell you that, Nitin, you are spending like say eighty thousand to buy an Activa today, versus if you spend like say one lakh, uh, you get a scooter, electric scooter, all sustainable, looks very good, looks very premium. You can actually control it on a mobile app. Uh, would you be willing to pay that twenty thousand extra? Yeah. With I mean, a top speed of like say eighty kilometers or ninety kilometers an hour. Yeah. Much bigger range. No, I get your point. The baselines are being met, so something like the connected device element of it becomes yes. far more interesting. Yeah. So broadly, two fundamental changes in the product that have happened now versus you know what was there earlier. One is practicality. Indian consumers, like we discussed, are value conscious. They want a practical product. Mm-hmm. Practicality includes pricing and range. The range has to be decent enough to do an inter intercity consu- uh, commute on a scooter, intercity commute on a vehicle. It has been solved to large extent because of battery chemistry. You know, much larger batteries, improvements, and so on. And so, so what changed there? So, on the battery chemistry is actually two things. One is the pricing of the battery, uh, which has lithium has gone down. So, just to give you some stats, lithium today is actually ninety eight percent cheaper than what it was three decades back. Mm-hmm. And by the way, ninety percent of this reduction has actually happened only in the last one decade. So that is the kind of change that has happened in the lithium-ion prices, which has reduced battery prices drastically. Now, to give you another stat, is this lithium commodity price or manufacturing economies of scale? It is the commodity price. Uh, okay. And we are not factoring in, you know, battery manufacturing scale. A B C D A two A one two three in China. Yes. All of these things. So it's primarily cost of lithium. The, so the iron itself has come down, and obviously there are economies of scale because of which there has which been, adds to it. Adds to uh, it has added to the overall. Price now a battery forms between twenty five percent to forty percent of a vehicle cost. So imagine a ninety percent reduction in that cost has significantly dropped that. That makes price. sense. So that is one practical change. One change on the practicality side. Second, the battery chemistry has fundamentally changed. So if you look at the chemistry today, it is we, we call it NMC. So uh, nickel, manganese, and cobalt. We've actually used to we used to have a very high share of cobalt, which we are slowly gradually reducing. And we are actually on the verge of adding aluminium on that chemistry as a different metal, which reduces the weight, and we are then able to pack much more power inside the same battery pack. So you do not increase the size; you actually reduce the weight, and the battery can give you much better output. The point that you're making is, despite these advances being in the future, what is already there is good enough. Yes, it is becoming yes. mainstream. Yes, and a lot has changed for us to get here, but a lot is changing for us to go do a quantum leap. And that's what creates a VC opportunity. Exactly. Okay, so that's super on product. Uh, next thing, pricing. Yep. Right. So, I mean, what has changed dramatically? The initial cost, or the lifetime cost of ownership? You know, how does one think about that? So, uh, like you said, Nitin, uh, there are two ways to think about pricing. One is the upfront cost, the money you have to pay to buy that vehicle. Second is total cost of ownership. The industry calls it TCO. Uh, it is essentially the lifetime cost of running a vehicle. Uh, so, there has been A major change in the upfront cost. Having said that, the upfront cost of an EV is still at a premium. What is it? To, What is it? So uh, it actually gets more pronounced as the vehicle form factor increases. So for a two-wheeler today, uh, the price difference between an ICE vehicle and the EV counterpart would be anywhere up to a twenty percent kind of a premium. EV is at a twenty percent kind of a premium. But when you look at a car, uh, it is actually at about fifty percent premium. That's because it requires a much larger battery. And hence, much larger costs. Makes sense. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, the pricing has come down, but uh, it's still at a premium. For a scooter, it still makes sense. A car is still some time away. But if you, we know Indians are value conscious. Yes. Even that twenty percent. Yes. Is significant, unless I guess you are saying you go to the total lifetime cost. Exactly. So the lifetime cost. So a consumer should not look at the upfront cost. Uh, just the upfront cost in silo. 
he should look at the upfront cost and the total cost of ownership i'll i'll show you how the math works yeah let's go through so uh, broadly you know um, tco has three components one is the upfront cost of the vehicle second is what is the running cost sure. how much do i spend in running the vehicle over time and the final is the resale value end of the life of the Makes vehicle sense. when i sell it what do i get the price of an electric vehicle today like i said let's let's talk about the tco for a uh, two wheeler mm -hmm. uh, for the sake of this discussion the price of a electric two wheeler today as is at about 20% premium to uh, its size counterpart if you look at maintenance cost this is what actually changes the game in favor of an electric scooter mm -hmm. Min uh, running cost can be broadly categorized into two one is the fuel or charging cost right second is the maintenance cost mm -hmm. the key difference the key differentiator is the fuel or charging cost in an electric vehicle your cost of charging is at about 15 to 20% that of the cost of fuel on an ic vehicle i'm just talking about a scooter right. obviously economics change as the form factor changes but for a scooter you pay 15% over the lifetime of the vehicle of what you would otherwise pay on fuel and by the way this just factors in let's say fuel at 100 rupee a liter and all of us know that it is increasing on a daily basis right so as the fuel prices goes on increasing this delta actually keeps right. on Makes increasing sense. further on the maintenance side because of lower number of moving parts and you know the engine has the maximum number of moving parts we've removed the engine from the vehicle replaced it with one pack one battery pack the maintenance cost for an electric vehicle is actually about 30 to 40% cheaper than it is for a, a ic counterpart and and what does that mean for a so let's say i want a scooter what does that look like per month so per month uh, like say uh, uh, i think per month would not would not be the right way to look at it like let's say if you ride let's say 50000 kilometers for instance okay. right over yeah. the lifetime of a vehicle so 5 years 50000 kilometers uh, if you if you uh, do the math we will we'll spend whatever we spend on fuel we'll spend so actually the fuel cost is almost equal to the vehicle price so let's like, say if you've paid about 85000 for an activa you'll pay up about 85 to 1 lakh 85000 to 1 lakh for fuel itself of which if you were to take an electric vehicle it is essentially around 15 to 20000 for an electric scooter a 3 kilowatt hour battery uh, that is what charging um, sorry say that again so 15 to 20000 is the cost of the fuel which is in this case just electricity for the for what period for 5 fi years 50000 year kilometers okay so time is not that relevant it's actually number the of kilometers mileage, yeah yeah, yeah. so 50000 kilometers would require like say about 2 lakh uh, about 20000 rupee uh, to be spent on charging whereas if it was a petrol vehicle you would actually spent about 85 to 1 lakh 85000 to 1 lakh on the fuel over the, over the yeah and then like, customers have started understanding this exactly math. exactly and then uh, then comes maintenance so because of lesser number of moving parts you spend lesser on maintenance you save about 30 to 40% as of now as it, with economies of scale uh, yeah, as more and more mechanics come mechanics in mechanics come service, in and service centers yes so it will the gap will widen even further uh, and then the final thing is resale value now this is where evs have a problem uh, today as on as on date we've not doubled down or we've not narrowed down on what is the use case or what is the resale value mm -hmm. going to be like which is one of the reasons why banks are not yet ready to finance an electric vehicle that easily So, um, how do we sum up the TCO difference? So, you said so I initial fifteen twenty percent higher, but yep. TCO is so uh, the TCO for an electric vehicle, electric scooter would actually be fifty percent cheaper. Fifty percent cheaper. Fifty percent cheaper over That's the life of the vehicle, yeah. and this is where I'm actually assuming a lower lower resale value for an electric vehicle. Even if you assume a lower resale value for an electric vehicle and a premium pricing, uh, the TCO is despite 50%. the fact that in actually electricity in a global sense electricity in india is more expensive than many exactly countries. okay so we've discussed product pricing <laughs> let's talk about charging now uh so what's the state of affairs and like what what is changing in charging so uh, in india we actually have less than 2000 charging stations for about 6 lakh electric vehicles that are there on the road today so the density is um, you know abysmal we need to do a lot of work on the density uh, the good thing Did, was there a, is there a tipping point uh, if you look at other countries us china of course very different uh, yeah. landscapes and geographies but uh, is there a tipping point after which the proposition becomes strong for people let's see charging stations as the market takes off so uh, you know like everyone in the industry says uh, and i do agree that it is true this is a chicken and egg problem yeah until charging setting up charging infra or shopping infra is a capex heavy business so right. it is serious it is serious business you have to put in a lot of money into it 
it only makes sense once there is a critical mass of vehicles on the road unfortunately today we do not have that critical mass on the road for for anyone to invest in it meaningfully having said that with the kind of traction we are seeing on the vehicle side and vehicle sale side there has been a lot of companies both on the on the government side uh, and on the private side who are now setting up charging infra we've heard news from big companies like reliance who are going all in into energy infrastructure setup companies like tata power have already been there in the market are expanding their focus global companies like abb for example have come into the market now and looking to expand their focus the fundamental shift all of this what whatever we've seen whatever i've spoken about is you know adding on and getting uh, more excited uh, in in the market right the fundamental shift is a change in the business model if you look at historically automotives were uh, a vertical focused business they were not full stack they only manufactured and distributed the vehicle mm-hmm. right? today automotives are going full stack sure companies are saying i will i will manufacture a vehicle i will set up charging infra i will you know set up financing services and all of that so oems are and that is what will lead to an initial adoption over time i think oems will again start verticalizing and rather than doing a full stack kind of an approach but today a full stack approach is required to get to that critical mass okay so when you say 2000 charging stations i mean doesn't that suggest this is the bottleneck this is the key right and most of the market will seems to be when we meet startups um we, we they talk about sort of new approaches to charging so this seems to be the key but i don't think you you don't agree with that you think it's still product and yes so i i don't think charging is uh, number one uh, reason it it is not it is not a constraint right people know that charging infra would be set up over time and people have the option of charging it at home right i mean the 2000 is just public charging stations and to clarify each of these stations might actually have multiple charging guns so That's... if it is like say 2000 charging stations on an average like say Uh, if there are two guns per charging station that actually means 40000 4000 vehicles that can be charged at any point of point of time right this does this is just public charging infra if you look at let's say charging the potential to charge in people's houses it's much more than the vehicles sold in the country so i don't think it is a problem and i'll back that with stacks again i'll use the same example like ola right they sold like say about a lakh vehicles in just two days do you think there has been a there has been a uh, charging infra addition in those two days no right the number of charging infra okay, is still the same point. yeah but uh, people have bought that vehicle but is there is it viable this charging infrastructure as a business model right for yeah. folks who are setting up uh, specific types of plugs etc i mean is there enough money to be made in charging uh, will that itself take care of it or will that separately need government or subsidies as of now it does not work the unit economics does not work because uh, see i mean this is this is a general uh, this this is a specific business model problem for um, for you to set up charging infra it only makes sense when you set it up in high density right now the unit economics for charging does not work uh, the reason is that you know for a charging business to be meaningful it has to be at a higher density so like you sure. we have petrol pumps today multiple petrol pumps in the same city we'll have to have that kind of infrastructure that kind of density to support electric vehicle now today there are very limited number of vehicles on the road that can use this charging infra which is why even if you set it up there will be limited demand and demand will mostly be in you know peak time cycles for example late at night early in the morning right makes uh, sense uh, but over time as you know the sales of vehicle more and more vehicles start coming on the road that's when it becomes a vi- viable business it is capex heavy it would require initial investment uh, but i don't think again subsidies is not really required. <coughs> but if i look at a vc model again it is capex heavy but yes. the product part is even more capex heavy so yes. i i would assume that we should be looking into certain areas to play and there is of course plug in charging and battery swapping so which one makes more sense for us so i think um, on charging versus swapping right uh, the end use is the same these are two very different ways of you know powering the vehicle from a long term perspective swapping is what works best because you know it has multiple benefits for a consumer you don't have to wait uh, for like say 3 hours to charge your vehicle you can just walk in swap the battery in less than 5 minutes walk out that's how seamless it is but today uh, swapping is much more capex heavy than charging is right uh, and uh, just because it is cheaper oems find it and charging infra setup pro- providers find it easier to set up a charging infrastructure and there are concerns around standardization of a battery which is required for effective swapping which today does not exist so charging is the short term and medium term opportunity in the long term i think swapping should be the way forward
Okay, so Vineet, I think you've made a very compelling case about yep. economies of scale, the downward pricing curves, and why this does actually still make sense from a VC perspective. But let me push a little bit more, right? Still, this is a big capital game, and yes. you have large OEMs, both the new generation ones focused on EVs, but also entire industry of legacy OEMs, right? And we're seeing that they are the investors in this space yep. and uh, they will obviously control the value chain to quite a large extent. Why should, what's in it for startups? Is it really that exciting? So on, on you know, to answer your question on the incumbents, um, like every other industry, uh, incumbents will be slow to react because they anyway have their own problems to deal with. But if you, if you see the very unique thing about, you know, incumbents in this space is unlike a lot of other spaces, incumbents have actually, some of them, have actually started reacting. Mm. Uh, they, you know, companies like TVS, Bajaj, for example, have come up with products. Uh, some of them are commercially sold today. So you can actually buy a TVS IQ, for instance, today. Sure. Right? Uh, now, ha- having said that, I think over the long term, uh, automotives is a oligopoly business, right? You will not have 50 manufacturers manufacturing. We'll have those, like say, top five, seven or 10 manufacturing across the world. So consolidation has to happen. It will happen over time. Uh, you know, it, either it's through MA or it's through JVs, uh, but the market will consolidate. It is either larger incumbents acquiring some of the new age players or larger new age players acquiring some of those even smaller ones. So broadly, yeah. that is how consolidation will happen. And companies have already started sowing seeds for the same. For example, Hero Motor Corp has an investment in Aether. TVS has an investment in ultraviolet automotive. Mm. So a lot of seeds have already been sown over time. You know, uh, these will materialize in a much bigger way. I think beyond the academic or intellectual part, right? I mean, our bread and butter is what does it mean for founders? Yep. Right. So let's try to zoom in on there are founders watching this, listening. Where, where are the opportunities for founders? So, uh, you know, a lot of people think that with OEMs going full stack, uh, there's not enough opportunity out there in the landscape to innovate. Uh, automotives, by the way, is like 7, 7% of India's GDP, GDP. So it's, it's a very large, massive sector and it impacts a lot of other sectors. And mm-hmm. the same thing is going to happen with electric vehicles. Mm-hmm. So electric vehicle opportunity is not just a mobility opportunity. It mm. is also a fintech. It's also an edtech opportunity. Uh, it's also a larger climate tech opportunity, right? Uh, now, if you look at, like, say, fintech, embedded in, like uh, embedded insurance, embedded finance, things like you know personalized insurance, that is a very big opportunity. If you can create, you know, use because these are connected vehicles, you can actually use telematics data to personalize insurance requirements, personalize finance requirements. Uh, so that is broadly which, which could happen with without EVs as well, with that Metro Mile exactly. in the US, for example. Exactly. But it just makes far more sense with EVs. Just because you know the products today are much more connected. So it's easier for you to underwrite. It's easier for you to build those product layer on top of it. So it is a fintech opportunity. It is also an edtech opportunity, uh, specifically around upscaling mechanics. Now, like I said, um, you know, uh, today service requirements for an EV is not that much, right? Because there are lesser number of moving parts. Is that venture scale? Uh, That is, that is venture scale because, you know, you, you look at the number of mechanics in India today across the length and breadth. Uh, most of the work on an IC vehicle is actually mechanical. Mm. Versus like say an electric vehicle would need more uh, electrical work. So you have to upskill these people. Now, how do you venture scale? Upskilling is, you know, just one part of it. You can upskill them, then keep on adding layers of, you know, B2B supplies or, you know, just continuous learning and development. Also lending to mechanics, helping them set up infrastructure, standardization, uh, branding, you know, setting up SOPs. So that's it's an entire massive, ecosystem. It's an entire ecosystem. But specifically, if we look at the edtech part of it is upskilling of mechanics. It's a huge market. And there is also potential for you to, you know, just go out there, acquire, like say, a thousand garages and then go to a Hero Electric or any other OEM and tell, get, become an exclusive service center for them. So yeah. you just get that ready access. That's on the edtech side. Now coming to the larger meta point around mobility. There are multiple opportunities on the mobility side for anyone who wants to innovate. Uh, first and foremost, we'll talk about charging infrastructure or swapping infrastructure setup. Yes, it is CAPEX intensive, but an entrepreneur's job is to innovate, right? Can we come out with innovative solutions that solve for that CAPEX intensity and se- can gives us the ability to set up charging infrastructure or swapping infrastructure at scale? Mm. Uh, that is something that we would be very interested in. Second is the overall battery and the battery management system. So can we come up with solutions which have better battery chemistry, 
better battery density it gives much better output in terms of power and energy uh, while consuming lesser number of resources right uh, and the overall battery management system in itself can we do innovation there so that is the other opportunity third i think this this would probably be more interesting for a vc plays the software layer can now like like we like we discussed uh, electric vehicles are connected right you actually in most of the new age electric vehicles today you actually have the dashboard look is like a tablet right so you can actually use it like it is your phone can companies build applications on top of it can companies build a software layer on top of it so that is something that would really be interesting and obviously like the standard old general telematics smart mobility yeah, kind that's of been around for a while no. yeah so that that is some but it's been around for a while but uh, adoption has not been that much because there was not enough capability both from the OEM side and the vehicle side to read and synthesize that data. They right. were generating it, but were not able to understand it. Today, we are in a much better position to understand. It. And last and broadly, I think uh, on the mobility side, B two B or fleet use cases would be a very important use case going forward, uh, because with the uh, you know higher upfront cost, companies would not like to buy these vehicles. So, can we you know build systems around like say mobility as a service, subscription, so on and so forth, more specifically targeted towards B two B use cases, fleet use cases. that will be a very interesting value yeah fleet management definitely changes a lot yeah okay vinny this has been great now i just want to summarize for our audience right what our main takeaways are and what is the sharp thesis that that we have so let's start going through the points you made today so number 1 it's this is here and now indeed it, it, it's it's not the future if we think of evs as the future we we just uh, we'll just lose the tide so it is here and now this is the time for us to get on the boat and you know back the best companies in the space okay number 2 uh, product is far more important than and charging is not the key constraint yes everybody has been talking about uh, charging and you know people have been saying that it's a chicken and egg problem uh, it's an easier answer uh, i really think and it's been proven by companies uh, over the last 4 5 6 months that product is key uh, and what makes tesla what it is is the product and not really you know charging for instance number 3 while it is here and now it really is here and now for two wheelers not for four wheelers yes because four wheelers still need to catch up in terms of both upfront cost and also tco because again uh, just to give you some thoughts and you know also for the viewers to help them understand when they should look at buying a vehicle if you drive 10000 kilometers a day and are looking to buy a, a two wheeler uh, anything be, be beyond like say a 10000 kilometer run over the life of the vehicle is good uh, and you can go ahead and buy a electric two wheeler but if you are a four wheeler uh, consumer looking to buy a car uh, on, only buy an electric vehicle as of now given the current pricing if your lifetime expected run is beyond a lakh uh, if you expect to drive below 1 lakh kilometers as of date it does not make sense for you You would rather save the five six lakhs additional that you're spending on that and drive a petrol vehicle. Obviously, I'm assuming that uh, you know uh, I'm not putting in sustainability as a factor here. If you want to be environmental conscious, then obviously EVs is the only choice. Got it. Number four, charging for now, swapping for later. Yes, uh, I think over time both will coexist. But here and now is charging. Swapping is still more of a long term thing. But over time, uh, at steady state, both will coexist. Number five. legacy players versus startups legacy players will catch up uh, it would still need them some time but they've already start sowing seeds uh, and startups there are enough opportunities for new companies new entrepreneurs to start something in the space across various different spectrum so yes uh, you know uh, legacy players will catch up and startups there is there's a lot to be innovated on and number 6 our thesis is there are four interesting areas the fintech opportunities the edtech opportunities the mobility and the b2b opportunities b2b yes absolutely Got it. All right. Well, let's go find some companies to fund. For sure, we are already talking to a few of them. Actually. <laughs> All right. Let's not disclose that. Yes. <laughs> absolutely. Vineet, that was awesome. I I learned a lot, and I certainly think that we should be very active in this space. And I hope a lot of founders reaching out will will reach out. Um, and I think that we have a longer piece. Yes. That will flesh out this entire thesis. So, yes. for anybody listening, do watch out for our uh, longer thesis piece where we go into much more detail on each of these aspects. And I think this is the first episode of Theory of Next. We are going to go into lots of new exciting areas, uh, most imminently crypto, Web three, DAOs, etc. 
but also over time, climate change, space tech, and a lot of other things. So hope you'll be with us for the next episode as well. Thank you.